the Committee on Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection and Innovation will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to receive testimony on stakeholder perspectives on the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. So good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to thank the witnesses for participating in today's hearing on the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021. Earlier this year, this committee held a joint hearing with the Committee on Oversight and Reform to examine the SolarWinds supply chain attack. Our oversight revealed a number of gaps in federal authorities, policies, and capabilities that Congress must address to secure its own networks and better serve its private sector partners. But what stood out to me was how lucky we were that FireEye disclosed that it had been compromised. Where would, where would we be if they chosen not to? At this hearing, at the hearing, excuse me, I asked whether we would benefit from implementing a mandatory cyber incident reporting framework. Microsoft President Brad Smith observed that today information is siloed and that we need one entity in a position to scan the entire horizon and connect the dots between all of the attacks or hacks that are taking place. SolarWinds President Sudhakar Ram, uh, Ramakrishna testified having a single entity and to which all of us can report to will serve the fundamental purpose of building speed and agility and argue that private enterprises quote should be instructed with reporting requirements and be made part of this community vision where public and private sectors can work together on addressing this issue, end quote. At the same hearing, FireEye CEO Kevin Mandia testified about the importance of centralizing intelligence to improve the speed at which the picture and vision will come together, end quote. That hearing convinced me that Congress must act to ensure the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, known as CISA, receives timely cyber incident information from critical infrastructure owners and operators. Since then, I've worked with Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, to draft legislation to establish a mandatory cyber incident reporting framework at CISA, and I'd like to thank them both for their support in this effort. The draft legislation we are discussing today is the product of months of dialogue with government officials and private sector stakeholders. I want to express my gratitude to those who worked with the committee to provide feedback on various drafts of the legislation. We've worked hard to draft the legislation in a manner that will result in the greatest security impact for both the federal government and the private sector. And I'm proud of the draft we have developed. Our bill would direct CISA after a 270 day period with mandatory windows of stakeholder consultation and comment to issue an interim final rule describing one, which critical infrastructure owners and operators are subject to the reporting requirement, two, which cyber incidents need to be reported, three, the mechanism for submitting reports, and four, other details necessary for implementation. Importantly, our bill seeks to establish this new mandatory reporting program in a way that sets it apart from CISA's voluntary cyber programs by establishing a new cyber incident review office and tasking this new office with a discrete mission of receiving, aggregating, analyzing, and securing cyber incident reports. The bill also aims to ensure that covered entities benefit from the new reporting requirement in three ways. First, our bill requires CISA to publish quarterly reports with anonymized findings to provide better situational awareness to its partners. Second, it directs CISA to identify any actionable threat 
intelligence that should be shared rapidly and confidentially with cyber, quote, first responders, end quote, to prevent or respond to other attacks. And third, it requires CISA to notify private sector entities that may have been impacted by data breaches or intrusions on federal networks. I'm pleased with the progress we've made on this legislation, but want to be clear that our work is ongoing. We remain open to additional questions and feedback because it is important to get this right. In recent days, I've been asked whether we would consider compliance challenges that certain small businesses may have. I want to be clear that we do not expect all critical infrastructure owners and operators to be subject to this reporting requirement. Rather, we expect it to apply only to a subset. That said, I would be certainly I would certainly be happy to explore whether we need to add language directing CISA to provide additional compliance assistance to small businesses that are determined to be covered entities. I look forward to hearing additional stakeholder perspectives on the legislation today. Before I close and without objection, I would like to include in the record letters of support from Clarity and Accenture as well as a letter signed by 18 associations, including ITI, the Cyber Threat Alliance, the American Gas Association, Airlines for America, and the Cyber Coalition, among others. Additionally, without objection, I include in the record comments from NCTA, MPPA, and NRECA. Again, I thank the witnesses for being here today and look forward to hearing their testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, for an opening statement. Mr. Garbarino. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I'd like to thank the Chairwoman Clark for calling this important hearing today. We have a large panel before us, so in the interest of time, I'll keep my remarks brief. Uh, there should be no question why we're here today. Over the past year, our nation has been subject to the devastating solar winds cyber espionage campaign, as well as the Microsoft Exchange and Pulse Secure vulnerabilities, and that's just against the federal government. Our nation's critical infrastructure has also been under attack, and the American people have begun to feel the impact. Everyone here remembers the ransomware attacks on Colonial Pipeline and JBS Meats, both of which had real-world impacts. The fact, that the, the fact of the matter is that something here must change. We cannot allow these devastating attacks on our nation to continue. We must ensure that CISA has the visibility it needs to help defend our federal networks and to help our critical infrastructure owners and operators protect themselves. I've been pleased to see our majority counterparts engage our members in productive conversations on this topic, and I hope we can continue the constructive dialogue here today. I'm particularly interested in learning from our witnesses about how they view some of the key provisions of this bill and what, if any, suggestions they have for edits. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. And again, thank you, Chairwoman Clark, for your leadership on this incredibly important topic. I yield back. I thank our ranking member for his uh, brevity and his opening remarks, but <laughs> certainly anything that uh, you have to add, we're, we're all ears. Uh, and I want to uh, thank uh, members, uh, and to, to remind members, uh, that the subcommittee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in their February 3rd colloquy regarding remote procedures. Uh, I don't see our chairman at this moment, but I do see our ranking member. Uh, so I want to uh, recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Kako, for an opening statement. Well, I'd like to thank my friend and colleague from New York, Chairwoman Clark, for convening this important hearing today. This legislative hearing is a fantastic opportunity for our members to learn directly from industry how they're impacted by specific provisions in the bill, as well as any excuse me, changes they suggest ahead of introduction. Everyone in this hearing should recognize the urgency and precision with which we need to act. Every single day, entities large and small are affected by the scourge of ransomware and cybercrime. From street level criminal gangs to nation state actors like Russia and China, nefarious actors target our private sector businesses, state and local governments, 
and federal agencies millions of times per day. Unfortunately, many of these attempts are ultimately successful. In order to bolster our nation's collective defense, we must enhance our visibility across both federal and private networks. I've been pleased with the response we've seen from industry so far, and I wanted to thank our witness, not just for being witnesses, not just for being here today, but for their diligent work in thinking through this legislative effort. I hope that everyone here today recognizes that our nation's cybersecurity cannot simply be a federal effort or a private effort, but that it is it is and must be a joint effort. And there's no doubt in my mind that cybersecurity is the preeminent threat to our country today. Without enhanced collaboration and visibility, we will continue to fall victim to the cowardly actors that target our nation, our constituents, and all of us on a daily basis. I've been pleased to work with Chairman Thompson, Chairwoman Clark, and all our critical industry partners on this bill. I look forward to continue prioritizing major cybersecurity reforms through this committee on a bipartisan basis, including my SICKI bill, which is coming up in the, in the next few days. That's a systemically important critical infrastructure. One of the things that drew me to this committee, other than just uh, my background in law enforcement over 20 years, is the fact that there's a, a spirit of bipartisanship here and there's a spirit of teamwork here that is manifesting itself again today. And I commend the chairwoman for that and uh, uh, Mr. Garbarino as well. But going forward, there's a lot of other things like uh, my, my systemically important crit critical infrastructure bill and many others that are going forward. And I hope we can have the same type of teamwork on that as well. So thank you again, uh, uh, Ms. Clark, for being here today. And, um, and thank you for holding this important hearing. And thank you for the witnesses as well. And thank you, Mr. Garbarino. And I yield back. I thank our, our ranking member for his comments and opening statement and I'm going to then uh, proceed to uh, our witnesses and should our chairman join us, um, we'll take a break to, to hear uh, his comments. I now welcome our panel of witnesses. First, I'd like to welcome Mr. Ron Bouchard, the Senior Vice President and Global Government CTO for FireEye Mandiant who works at the intersection of public-private incident response efforts for the types of cyber attacks we are here to discuss today. Second, we'll hear from Ms. Heather Bonset with the Bank Policy Institute, also known as BPI, a nonpartisan research and advocacy group representing the nation's top banks. Ms. Hobson is the Senior Vice President of Technology and Risk Strategy for BITS, the Technology Policy Division of BPI. Third, we have Mr. John Miller, the Senior Vice President of Policy and General, General Counsel for the Information Technology Industry Council, also known as ITI, which represents the world's leading information and communication technology companies. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Robert Mayer, back before the subcommittee. Mr. Mayor is the Senior Vice President for Cybersecurity and Innovation at the U.S. Telecom and chairs the Communications Sector Coordinating Council. And then finally, we have Ms. Kimberly Dembo, the Managing Director of Security and Operations for the American Gas Association, who also co-chairs the Cybersecurity Working Group for the Pipeline Sector Coordinating Council and the oil and natural gas sector. Without objection, the witnesses' full statements will be inserted in the record. I now ask each witness to summarize his or her statement for five minutes, beginning with Mr. Bouchard. Mr. Bouchard, I believe you may be muted. Always a good start to to a hearing. Apologies, Chairwoman. Um, thank you, Chairwoman Clark, Ranking Member Gabarino, and all the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to talk with you today about this important cyber incident reporting topic. FireEye Mandiant applauds your efforts to tackle this complex issue and appreciates the open dialogue we've enjoyed with you and your staff. Public-private partnerships are critical to the success of any cyber incident reporting or disclosure program, both in its de development and ultimately in its execution. My comments for today's hearings will focus primarily on the major tenets and benefits of a cyber incident reporting framework, 
But before I turn to this specific topic, let me share some background on myself and my company to establish context for my narrative and statements today. I started my career in the United States Air Force as an officer in what was at the time termed information warfare. Uh, for more than 20 years, I've worked in cyber defense operations, cybersecurity consulting, and incident response services in both the government and commercial sectors, including time at the US, US Department of Justice. In my current role at Fire Mandiant, I lead a global team of cyber experts who deliver our capabilities and security uh, functionality and solutions to protect critical missions, infrastructure, and national security interests worldwide. As I testify today, FireEye Mandiant employees are on the front lines of a cyber security battle, really, um, responding to over 150 active computer intrusions at some of the largest organizations and companies in the world. Over the last 17 years, we've responded to tens of thousands of security incidents. And it's unfortunate, but we receive calls almost daily from organizations that have suffered a cybersecurity breach. For each security incident we respond to, it's our objective to determine what happened and what organizations can do to avoid similar incidents in the future. We also maintain over 200 intelligence professionals and analysts located in more than 20 countries, speaking over 30 languages who pursue attribution, identification, and more detailed information about threat actors, their motivations, and intents. FireEye Mandiant is encouraged by the draft legislation the subcommittee has developed to improve cyber incident reporting. The bill is a positive step forward in achieving important long-term goals of enabling early detection of malicious cyber attacks. It would also enhance the federal government's situational awareness to better partner with and assist private sector entities that become cyber attack victims. This whole of community approach is critical to increasing capacity and to prevent future uh, cyber attacks, as well as to drive, ultimately, we believe, deterrence in this space. Any legislation on this matter should take into consideration the evolving cyber threat landscape. The increasingly sophisticated tactics, techniques, and procedures used by adversaries and lessons learned from existing voluntary information sharing models, as established by the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, simply put, any reporting framework must be agile and include opportunities for the federal government to pivot or adjust its reporting requirements to keep pace with the threat landscape and actor and adversary actions and activity. The U.S. government should consider a federal incident reporting program that goes beyond the voluntary sharing of threat indicators as authorized under the 2015 legislation. It should also include mandatory disclosure requirements for cyber incidents. Major tenets of such a program should safeguard the protection and integrity of electronic and other types of data, ensure confidential sharing, encourage entities to adopt recognized cybersecurity standards and practices with a minimum threshold, provide greater incentives for private sector entities, including liability protections and statutory privilege to not be disclosed in civil litigation, protect privacy and civil rights, and provide outreach and technical assistance to entities that do not have cybersecurity expertise or capabilities. FireEye Mandiant believes that strong cyber community protection is predicated on several key concepts, and lawmakers should consider the following additional components that we believe would constitute a robust and ultimately successful cyber incident reporting program. Number one, reporting requirements should account for two key outcomes, timely and relevant reporting of critical intelligence to relevant government authorities for assessment, correlation, and decision support, and number two, reasonable latitude for the victim to determine nature, extent, and potential impact of a breach or attack. In the first instance, the timeliness and quality of the data reported to the government will largely determine how effective the response to and disruption of the attack will ultimately be. In the second instance, cyber attacks are often complex and require sophisticated analysis to fully understand the scope of compromise. Victims require support from external firms to fully analyze a breach and will likely be dealing with other business impacts and crisis management activities during such activities. Allowing for a reasonable amount of time to properly assess the situation before requiring reporting will limit false positives and redundant or contradictory information and prevent unnecessary data collection on the part of CISA. FireEye Mandiant encourages lawmakers to consider harmonizing reporting requirements with existing federal acquisition regulations and standards to provide for consistent and streamlined regime that simplifies business processes and ultimately uh, encourages and, and streamlines compliance as well. Secondly, FireEye Mandiant strongly believes in the concept of a public-private partner approach to cybersecurity. Unlike most other domains of risk, cyber attacks and cyber crime are almost always predicated 
on the use of use, traversal, or compromise of privately owned infrastructure, even when the attacks are focused on government or national security assets. The private sector, especially critical infrastructure sector businesses, is both a key component of overall national cyber resiliency and a key source of intelligence on our adversaries' capability, intent, and activities in cyberspace. Over the past decade, many federal agencies, including CISA, the FBI, the United States Secret Service, and the National Security Agency, have built strong partnerships with key cybersecurity and critical infrastructure organizations through voluntary programs, outreach, and support. While we recognize that much more needs to be done, without these efforts and support functions, many private sector cyber attacks would have likely remained undetected for much longer and would have been much more severe. Under a new cyber incident reporting program, these trusted relationships and partnerships must be strengthened and enhanced to advance our common goals of reducing the frequency and severity of cyber attacks. Number three, a reporting program must en encourage cooperation and strengthen trust between public and private sector uh, entities. A regulatory-based approach or a regime that focuses on punitive actions rather than mutual benefits would be counter to the goal of creating a strong national partnership model to counter the increasing cyber threats we are facing. As previously suggested, although mandatory reporting is necessary, the focus should be on supporting organizations to achieve compliance, not punishment for noncompliance. Fines and other financial or legal punishments do not properly reflect the truth that barring gross negligence or willful misconduct, organizations that suffer a cyber attack are victims of a crime. Mechanisms to compel collection of critical information when necessary, such as subpoenas, better align to the general concept of criminal investigation and response. Fourth, information sharing must be bi-directional. An incident reporting framework should allow for a consistent flow of two-way information sharing between public and private sectors to help maximize the ability to resolve and consider attribution. Organizations that invest significant effort into collecting, analyzing, and sharing cyber attack technical information require feedback on the usefulness and value of what they provided. They also benefit from data that can be only provided by the United States government to enhance their own security posture and to help hone their threat detection and response functions. Finally, I'd like to highlight several clear benefits of broader security incident reporting and bi-directional information sharing. Timely reporting of incidents within and across sectors allow for early detection of large, sophisticated cyber campaigns that have the potential for significant impacts to critical infrastructure or national security implications. Technical indicators, along with contextual information, provide a more robust data set to conduct faster and more accurate attribution and adversary intent. This type of an analysis is critical in formulating the most impactful response to such attacks and to do so in a time frame that has a higher probability of successful countermeasures or deterrence. On behalf of Fire and Mandiant, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. We're committed to working with our public and private sector partners to safeguard the nation from cyber attacks by sharing cyber threat information, lessons learned, and best practices, including through the newly established Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative at CISA. We stand ready to work with you and other interested parties to devise effective solutions to deter malicious behavior in cyberspace and to build a better resiliency into our networks and ultimately improve and enhance the security and well being of all Americans. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions today. I thank you, Mr. Bashar, for your expert testimony here today. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by the gentleman from Mississippi the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Thompson, who will be uh, submitting his opening statement for the record, but wanted to acknowledge his presence, um, but now recognize Ms. Hogsett to summarize her statement for five minutes. Thank you. Chairwoman Clark, Ranking Member Gabarino, and honorable members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify. I'm Heather Hogsett, Senior Vice President of Technology and Risk Strategy for BITS, the Technology Policy Division at the Bank Policy Institute. BPI is a nonpartisan policy research and advocacy organization representing the nation's leading banks. Through our Technology Division BITS, we work with our member banks as well as other leading financial institutions on cyber risk management and critical infrastructure protection, as well as fraud reduction, regulation, and innovation. I also serve as Policy Committee Co-Chair for the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council, which coordinates across the financial sector and with government partners to enhance security and resiliency. 
On behalf of BPI's member firms, we greatly appreciate this committee's leadership on cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection. We also appreciate the work of the committee on the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021, which is focused on addressing an urgent need for government and critical infrastructure to share cyber in information to improve awareness of cyber threats and better inform our collective ability to mitigate and respond to them. Banks and other financial institutions have had legal and regulatory requirements for cybersecurity and incident reporting for more than 20 years. In addition to required regulatory reporting, financial firms have made significant investments to protect the industry, developing high trust collaboration centers to improve resilience at individual firms and across the broader financial system, through digital infrastructure, comprehensive use of security tools, exercise programs, and extensive training. Based on past experience, we are encouraged to see that the current draft bill includes five key elements that we believe are vital to achieving our shared goal of protecting the nation's critical infrastructure. First, the bill appropriately tailors the scope of incidents that should be reported to those that could cause actual harm. This will ensure CISA receives accurate and useful data to help achieve its goal of greater situational awareness. Second, the timeline for reporting of no earlier than 72 hours after confirmation an incident has occurred strikes the right balance to allow a firm sufficient time for investigation and implementation of response measures while reporting timely, accurate, and useful information to CISA. The initial stages of an incident response require all hands on deck and frontline cyber defenders should be focused on investigation, response, and remediation rather than completing compliance paperwork. Third is the need to ensure harmonization with existing requirements. For already regulated critical infrastructure sectors, it is vital to ensure new requirements are harmonized with existing laws and regulations. Financial institutions are regularly examined for their cybersecurity operations and compliance with reporting requirements and may be subject to penalties and other enforcement mechanisms for deficiencies or failures to comply. The bill currently includes helpful provisions to require CISA to coordinate with other agencies and regulatory authorities to streamline reporting requirements. The bill also builds off the Cybersecurity and Information Sharing Act of 2015. We support the committee clearly incorporating the key definitions and protections already created by the CISA Act for private firms sharing information with government. Any bill that seeks to mandate cyber information sharing should incorporate these protections, and we appreciate that you've clearly defined that in your bill. Finally, the bill addresses the need to help companies understand if their data has been compromised by an attack on a government system. While the SolarWinds attack targeted several federal agencies, it also impacted a much broader swath of entities, including critical infrastructure companies. Financial services firms are required to share sensitive and confidential information with regulators and other government agencies that if breached, could pose risks to the institution and its customers. To this end, the bill includes language to address this need for greater transparency. In closing, I would note that there is an additional area that we would like to continue working with you on, and that is around the need for improvements to bi-directional information sharing and collaboration. Current information sharing is often one-sided from government, from industry to government, and the alerts and warnings industry receives from government are often delayed, limiting their usefulness. As CISA, along with intelligence and law enforcement agencies, strengthened coordination and collaboration with the private sector, we urge Congress to ensure government agencies are improving the speed and quality of information provided back to critical infrastructure. Again, thank you for your leadership on cybersecurity and your thoughtful approach to crafting this legislation. We look forward to continuing to work with this committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mute. Um. Chairwoman, I believe you may be I, on mute. I think I was on mute. Did everyone hear me? No. <laughs> I'm no. sorry about that. They always catch you, don't they? Uh, let me thank Ms. Hoxett for her expert testimony here today. I now recognize Mr. Miller to summarize his statement for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairs Clark and Thompson, Ranking Members Garbarino and Katko, distinguished members of the subcommittee, 
On behalf of the Information Technology Industry Council, or ITI, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021. ITI is a global policy and advocacy organization representing 80 of the world's leading ICT companies. And I lead ITI's trust data and technology policy team, including our work on cybersecurity globally. As the current vice chair of the Information Technology Sector Coordinating Council and co-chair of the ICT Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force, I have significant experience partnering with CISA on efforts to improve cyber supply chain and critical infrastructure security and welcome your interest on this important topic. I would also like to thank you and your staffs for the thoughtful and collaborative approach you've taken with stakeholders while drafting this legislation. If narrowly scoped and carefully crafted, we believe that an incident reporting regime can help improve the nation's cyber resilience and security by increasing situational awareness across government and critical infrastructure and driving more effective operational collaboration in response to significant incidents. We commend the subcommittee for its leadership on this issue and commitment to developing an effective and efficient cyber incident reporting regime. And we appreciate the act leaves many of the details to be worked out through a rulemaking process prioritizing CISA engagement with stakeholders. Developing an effective and efficient incident reporting regime, while at the same time preserving the partnership and collaborative model that is central to CISA's mission, are both important goals. Just last month, ITI published policy principles for cyber incident reporting, which are attached to my written testimony, and I encourage the subcommittee to consider in full. ITI also led a multi-association letter to Congress sent last Friday, stressing several issues that any incident reporting legislation should address. I will focus the balance of my time on five key recommendations included in both our policy principles and the letter. First, we recommend any legislation allow for feasible reporting timelines commensurate with incident severity levels, but of no less than 72 hours. Ensuring timelines are feasible is important for several reasons, including allowing entities sufficient time to determine what has occurred and ensuring an incident is properly contextualized, upholding cybersecurity while an entity investigates an incident, and to align with global best practices. We appreciate the act makes clear CISA may not require reporting earlier than 72 hours after an entity confirms an incident has occurred. Second, we recommend any legislation maintain appropriate confidentiality, non-disclosure, and liability protections. We welcome the act's intent to extend liability protections and FOIA exemptions from the CISA 2015 information sharing legislation to reports provided pursuant to the act, but note the language of CISA 2015 may need to be updated to align with the specific categories of incident reporting information that are ultimately required by the pending rule. Further, the act should define clear confidentiality and privacy requirements regarding the use of shared information, including to require that any information disseminated to interagency partners is scrubbed of the providing entities identifying information. Third, we urge Congress to harmonize existing regulatory reporting requirements to ensure companies are able to efficiently report incidents and not subject to contradictory or duplicative reporting requirements that may hamper notification. We appreciate the Act directs CISA to consider existing regulatory requirements and work with relevant regulatory authorities and recommend adding language clarifying that CISA should leverage existing channels to collect incident information whenever possible including active interfaces with the FBI, SEC, and financial sector regulators to truly lessen the regulatory burden. Fourth, we recommend any legislation establish appropriate reporting thresholds and limit reporting to verified incidents. The Act's inclusion of minimum thresholds for reporting a covered incident built on a risk-based analytical model and it's focused on verified incidents as opposed to near misses hit the mark. However, there is ambiguity in the minimum threshold language that could be resolved through the concept of an incident categorization matrix, which could more accurately determine the severity of actual harm posed by incidents, enabling finer prioritization and more precise reporting. Finally, we maintain that reporting obligations in any legislation should fall only on impacted entities, not on vendors or third party service providers. An incident reporting requirement with a broader scope could disrupt normal business operations, including potentially forcing vendors or third parties to disclose business confidential in information of impacted customers or breach their contractual obligations and result in flooding CISA with multiple duplicative reports, diverting limited resources away from cyber incident response. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions.
we thank you for your expert testimony here today, Mr. Mr. Miller, and uh, I now recognize Mr. Meyer to summarize his statement for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Clark, Ranking Member Garbarino, Chairman Thompson, and Ranking Member Katko, and other distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing to express our industry support for the provisions included in the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021. My name is Robert Mayer, and I am the Senior Vice President for Cybersecurity and Innovation at U.S. Telecom, the broadband association representing broadband providers, suppliers, and innovators connecting our families, communities, and enterprises. Our diverse membership ranges from large publicly traded global communications providers, manufacturers, and technology enterprises to local companies and cooperatives, all providing advanced communication services to markets, urban and rural, and everything in between. I also serve as the chair, chair of the Communication Sector Coordinating Council, which represents uh, five communication segments, broadcast, cable, satellite, wireless, and wireline. And as co-chair of the Department of Homeland Security Information and Communications Technology, Technology Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force. In all of these roles, I've seen firsthand how the cybersecurity threats we face are real and growing. On an almost daily basis, we learn of attacks by nation state adversaries and global criminal enterprises that disrupt or exploit access to functions that support our daily lives. We in industry recognize the core interest of government in enhancing the nation's cybersecurity and the key role of government industry partnership in doing so, including through more, through more robust and coordinated information sharing and incident reporting and response. We also recognize the unique resources the government has available to aid private sector organizations when responding to a major cyber crisis. For these reasons, I'm here today to express our industry support for legislation that would establish cyber incident reporting capabilities within CISA. We believe that the following elements are critical success factors in any incident reporting regime, and we're encouraged to see that they are included in the current proposal. First, when a cyber incident occurs, impacted organizations need time to investigate the incident determine whether reporting criteria have been met and comply with applicable best practices. The proposed legislation provides for a reporting window that is flexible and large enough for industry to triage the incident. Second, defining reporting thresholds is a highly technical exercise that requires extensive subject matter expertise. The thresholds need to be specific enough to avoid ambiguity so that industry knows exactly how to comply. The legislation under consideration directs federal agency experts to define thresholds in consultation with industry. Moreover, to avoid undermining the system with overreporting, only confirmed cyber incidents are to re be reported, not potential or unverified incidents. This grounds the thresholds and criteria that are verifiable, attributable, and actionable. Third, the legislation strives to protect the government's industry partners when they are victims of cyber attacks. By building upon liability protections afforded in the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, the stage is set for strong legal and conceptual foundation for such protections. Fourth, when the government collects sensitive information from industry partners, it has a responsibility to protect that information. To that end, the legislation includes provisions to ensure data from incident reports is not shared inappropriately or leaked once it is provided to CISA. Fifth, any policy requiring ISPs to report customers' incidents would be cause for concern on a number of grounds, including public policy and privacy concerns, disruptions to business relationships and operations, and possible legal issues associated with those kinds of disclosures. The reporting obligations in the proposed legislation reside with the victims of cyber attacks and not intermediaries or third parties. In addition to the above critical success factors that are included in the bill, we are further encouraged by the following aspects of the proposed legislation. Cyber incident reporting is best enforced with subpoenas rather than fines. The legislation under consideration today wisely relies on subpoenas rather than fines as an enforcement mechanism for cybersecurity reporting. CISA should serve as a central hub for information sharing and incident reporting. This legislation appropriately directs CISA to shape and maintain this reporting and information sharing program. CISA is uniquely well suited to serve as a central hub for cybersecurity information sharing and incident reporting. While CISA has a central role to play, a new reporting concert should take into account that other federal agencies will continue to be engaged with the private sector. 
Recognizing that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility across the ecosystem, we appreciate that the legislation requires the United States government to take its obligations to report and share cybersecurity information seriously, just as industry takes its own obligations seriously. U.S. telecom and the communications sector stand ready to work with the committee to advance this legislation and will continue to collaborate in partnership with CISA to continuously advance our nation's cybersecurity. <clears throat> Uh, risk management, management and response capabilities. Thank you for your leadership and for prioritizing this critical issue. I look forward to your questions. We thank you for your expert testimony here today, Mr. Meyer, and I now recognize Ms. Dembo to summarize her statement for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Clark, Ranking Member Gabarino, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Kimberly Dembo, Managing Director of Security and Operations of the American Gas Association, AGA. I've led AGA security policy and technical program for nearly two decades. I'm a former mem voting member, former voting member of the TSA Surface Transportation Security Advisory Committee and co-chaired the Cybersecurity Subcommittee. I presently co-chair the Cybersecurity Working Group for both the Oil and Natural Gas Sector Coordinating Council and the Pipeline Sector Coordinating Council. Thank you for inviting me to share my perspectives on the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021 and sharing AGA's general approach to cybersecurity. AGA represents more than 200 local energy companies that deliver clean and affordable natural gas to 95% of natural gas customers in the United States. AGA supports the provisions necessary for a workable incident reporting framework as laid out in the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2021. These provisions include report timing of 72 hours after confirmation of the incident, clarity provided around supplemental reporting, harmonization of new reporting rules with pre-existing pre reporting requirements, leveraging the information sharing and analysis centers, and operator liability, information, and regulatory protection. Properly framed cybersecurity incident reporting can help counter adversaries and minimize impact with slight alterations, particularly, particularly regarding private sector involvement, this bill can be even stronger. Suggested improvements include Specify outreach to sector coordinating councils in development of the interim final rule. Ensure flexibility and regular updates to the list of covered entities. Ensure CISA has the staffing and sector specific expertise necessary to coordinate and communicate with operators. And limit CISA director discretion to ensure any disclosure of reported information is non attributional. Cybersecurity management is an endless evolution. For nearly two decades, AGA operators worked within a structured oversight model conceived by TSA, our pipeline security authority. This unconventional and non-regulatory model achieved something the traditional stick and carrot approach could not, constructive information exchange at a level of confidence and cooperation not typically available to regulators. TSA surface transportation has always done more with less and on a shoestring budget. For instance, to develop the TSA pipeline security guideline, the mechanism that underpins pipeline security and has advanced pipeline security by orders of magnitude, TSA collaborated with pipeline operators, CISA, and other entities. The quality output from TSA has been the result of the dedication of TSA staff in partnership with pipeline operators towards a shared common goal, pipeline security. That said, when done right, regulations can be beneficial. For example, through the collaboration of nearly 70 organizations, including TSA, CISA, trade associations, and pipeline operators, the consensus-based standard API 1164 version 3 pipeline control system cybersecurity was developed as a tool to help operators manage cyber risks in control system environments and at critical connection points along the supply chain. As TSA transitions from the structured oversight model 
to more traditional regulation, API 1164 version 3 will be the most efficient way to put effective pipeline cyber regulations in place. In a similar manner, this cyber incident reporting legislation has the potential to advance constructive reporting requirements. The key to meeting this potential lies with CISA and its commitment to the partnership. The AGA Board of Directors supports an industry-wide cybersecurity commitment and recently agreed to support reasonable cybersecurity regulations. And while there is no single cybersecurity solution for absolute system protection, vigilance, technological capability, and leadership commitment will continue to keep America's natural gas delivery system safe, secure, and reliable. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to the exchange of ideas. Ms. Dembo, I want to thank you for your expert testimony here today. And I thank all of our witness, witnesses for testifying. I will remind the subcommittee that we will each have five minutes to question the panel. I will now recognize myself for questions. And this quest, first question is to all of our witnesses today. For the past several months, I've worked with stakeholders to craft legislation that one, give CISA the visibility it needs to be a more effective partner to the private sector, and two, informs our understanding of cyber threats in a way that supports long-term systemic improvements to the cybersecurity ecosystem. Many of the questions about how to do this effectively are questions of scope, defining what information CISA needs to be bringing in and setting clear expectations about what CISA needs to be putting out. What specific information does CISA need about a cyber incident in order to detect cyber campaigns early and help other owners and operators defend themselves? And is this the same information CISA needs in order to understand threats over time and help owners and operators buy down risk? Uh, so I, I can start, uh, Chairwoman, answering that question. Um, so I believe, you know, generally speaking, th that CISA will require what we often term technical indicators of compromise or IOCs as part of any analysis function uh, and collection effort on their behalf. So what we often um, recommend is the ability for the victims uh, in the covered entities to be able to provide technical indicators of compromise, which can include things such as IP addresses, domain names, tools, pieces of malware, software that are being used in the attack, along with uh, techniques, so not necessarily software, but uh, behavioral-based um, techniques that the victims are observing the attackers taking, such as phishing uh, lures or email and, and uh, things of that nature. That sort of information when correlated across sectors or across industries or even within um, several organizations can often increase uh, the re rapidity and um, accuracy of attribution of threat actors. Um, the additional context that CISA may require uh, related to strategic analysis would have to do with things such as uh, targeting. And what I mean by that, that would be information more related to what sort of data or information systems appeared to be targeted by the threat actor, what data was confirmed to be taken out of the environment, if that's known, um, what sort of uh, people or personas attempted to be um, compromised during the attack, whether that's you know uh, position, executive positions in the organization, other sorts of um, key leadership inside the organization. Those can all be useful information, uh, points of information for analysis of threat actor intent and where they would likely see similar sorts of attacks and behavior emerging again across sectors or within sectors. So those two, those two broad categories of information we feel are, are valuable to CISA to, to collect and understand again in a non-attributional way wherever possible or at least in an anonymized way uh, for each victim. So if the uh, other panelists agree with Mr. Bouchard, let me ask what information and intelligence do your industries need from CISA in order to defend against threats today and in the future? And what makes information actionable 
for your purposes? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, Chairwoman. It's it's, it's very similar to the answer uh, in the direction of CISA, frankly. So when uh, the government has access to that sort of indicator information, um, in, again, in a, in a non-victim attribution model, we in the private sector can oft, often make use of that information in similar ways by correlating information, by comparing that information to what we're seeing across our customer set and to deconflict or, or to understand where, um, where these threat actors may be operating that we don't have perfect visibility. It's really completing you know, that, that fuller picture for everyone in the community to understand where uh, threat actors are acting and how they're behaving and how to, how to catch them as well. So that data is, is extremely valuable to commercial companies to put into detection uh, tools, to software, uh, to drive uh, rap more rapid, again, detection and ideally prevention, right? So the, the ultimate goal in feeding information back from the government to the private sector would be to uh, inoculate and, and to use a kind of a comparison. It would be an inoculation. So we saw the first victim. We understand what happened there. Now I can take that vaccine of, of information and apply it to all my other clients. And now if the, the, that same threat actor tries to use that exact same um, capability against other victims, it won't work if they're protected. Thank you, Mr. Bashar. My, my time has elapsed and I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, for his questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Actually, I want to follow up on, it uh, wasn't the way I was going to start, but I want to follow up on uh, what you were just talking about um, with what to what should be reported. And, and uh, my question to witnesses is, on a covered incident, and we have a different groups on here, telecom and banks and energy, and sh sh it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a, a one size fits all approach, right? Uh, um, how do we determine? Is this something we set out legislatively in the actual text, or are we going to have to do this in rulemaking? And how do we make sure it's done right in uh, in the rulemaking? And uh, Ms. Dembo, I'll start with you. I saw you raise your hand real quick. Thank you. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I believe that the quickest way to get to an effective solution is, again, to consult with the sector management risk agencies and the sector coordinating councils. That's where you are able to bring together the communities that have the subject matter expertise in the various critical infrastructure sectors already there. So you already have that learning curve taken care of and you're diving right into the middle of the pool, so to speak. Mr. Mayor, you, had, you uh, wanted to add on to that? Yeah, I, I do, thank you. So um, I think definitely it's not about putting legislative language in that becomes very prescriptive in terms of what, how to characterize an incident because incidents are evolving and we need the flexibility uh, to take in the information, relevant information associated with different attacks. Uh, one of the things that I think speaks well to the legislation is you've already identified some considerations uh, that would be considered. So, for example, uh, is it a, how sophisticated is the attack? Is this a novel attack? Something new that we haven't seen before? Uh, who's going to be affected by the, by the attack? What's the potential uh, impacts of cascading effects? Um, does it impact industrial control systems, skaters, uh, different systems? How does that work? Um, and I think that we can work within those parameters, and as I fully anticipate, we'll have an opportunity to engage uh, CISA in the interim rules and then the final rules, is to bring subject matter experts, sector specific subject matter experts, because what works uh, involves our networks and our, and our systems is different than what Kimberly systems look like or what the banking systems look like. Uh, we, really, we really need, and this is something where I think industry makes a very significant contribution, is we bring subject matter experts to the discussion, to the partnership with CISA. These are frontline workers, so there are some limitations in terms of how much we can demand from them, but we really can't go forward to making these kind of decisions around what, how to define a covered incident without that kind of industry-specific input. I actually appreciate that and the, both your answers uh, because I think it's a great idea, Ms. Dembo, that uh, we deal specifically with the uh, 16 different critical infrastructure subgroups there are now. I, I think um, DHS should be, maybe there's something we can put in there that, that maybe they set up different requirements for different ones, um, but they deal specifically with those agencies. Um, I think that's a great idea. Another question I have is about 
the quarterly reporting. Um, Mr. Mayor, you, you report, you just talked about how these things happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. Is it us, is CISA releasing a report every quarter? Is that good enough? Um, I mean, it, and the reason why is three months later, it might not mean anything anymore. You know, it's, it, things move very quickly. Yeah, so I, I tell you, I credit CISA with not, they're not gonna wait three months. The three months, as I understand it in the context of the legislation is designed to encapsulate what they learned, aggregate the information, anonymize it and push it out. CISA has been incredibly responsive and timely in pushing out information about threats. Um, we've seen information on, on all types of malware, on ransomware. In some instances, they've uh, affiliated with NSA in pushing out information, affiliated with the FBI. Um, they're not sitting on the information. And then we engage with CISA, I would say pretty much on a daily basis when it comes to receiving alerts and what, you know, sharing what we've discovered in our systems, what they're observing either on the federal agency. So the dialogue is already taking place. I think the benefit of this is there's going to be a virtual cycle because as these uh, incidents evolve, there are going to be new uh, TTPs, new, new tactics and techniques and procedures. They're going to require different ways of responding to them. CIS is going to have the benefit of more data and information, and they're going to take those lessons learned, I believe, and deliver them in an unclassified way to, to the to the infra critical infrastructure sector. So um, I think it's a balance, and I think it's accretive in terms of its value. Uh, Ms. Demba, did you just want to add something real quick? I saw you raise your hand. I actually, thank you, and I actually do. Um, with respect to working with CISA, and our various um, sector risk management agencies and their intel groups. It's very important that the intelligence community comes together with the operators to be able to determine what is worth downgrading from this top secret level to that next level so that they're not spending time trying to reclassify something that really is of no use to the operator. Um, for example, we are still waiting on a threat briefing in response to the issuance of the secure pipeline security directive. And the challenge there, and it's not on um, the staff at TSA or CISA because they're doing the best that they can, is trying to downgrade that information to a level that is valuable to the operators. What would be great if we could get subject matter experts from the field sitting in with CISA and TSA to say, you know what, that's what needs to be downgraded, not that. That wastes your time. That wastes our time. Just give us this. I appreciate that. I'm out of time, uh, but I appreciate those answers. Thank you. I yield back, uh, Chairwoman. I thank you, Ranking Member. I, I now recognize uh, the Chairman of the full committee, Ms. the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his questions at this time. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I apologize for being a little late. Uh, I was on a call with the FEMA administrator. We are uh, managing uh, Hurricane Ida down in, in my state right now. Uh, as you've indicated, I have a statement for the record. Uh, I'm glad to hear uh, from the witnesses uh, their interest in your legislation. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to get it right. Uh, stakeholder engagement is absolutely important. Uh, and as you know, this might be uh, our 2.0 initiative because uh, we tried a similar effort uh, in our Cyber Act of 2015 uh, to incentivize voluntary public-private information sharing. And unfortunately, uh, no one has gotten out of what they bargained for. So. What I'd like to get from our witnesses, starting with Mr. Bashar, is how do you, how can we make sure uh, this cyber incident reporting legislation is crafted in a way that brings real security value so we aren't having the same conversation um, six years from now? Uh, yes, sir. Um, thank you for the question. I, I think it, it goes to uh, what I made, what I stated in my opening statement as well as some of the other uh, witnesses here today. There has to be some flexibility in the rulemaking process. I think what we've learned in the interceding six years between the, the legislation um, being drafted in 2015 and today is 
you know, there's certainly some limitations to voluntary regimes, let's be honest, right? I, I think you're only going to get so much, um, um, you know, cooperation there. And I think it's been tremendous, but maybe there are certain groups or certain, um, you know, commercial entities that just aren't incentivized to, to share that data today. The other factor I believe that, that comes into play is really important in, in terms of um, getting this legislation correct is the flexibility in the process, because as we stated, the threats change and, and rapidly evolve. And that's not only on the capabilities of, of the adversaries we're dealing with, it's also the technology and the underlying capabilities of the companies using IT infrastructure and the way that that becomes more critical to their operations and business over time. So we have to be able to adjust what's important from an information collection and sharing regime over time. There has to be an ability for, um, you know, regulated, but also um, cohesiveness in the way that information is collected and used. And as I stated in my, in my testimony, I think that two way uh, communication information sharing has to be uh, effective, timely and relevant to, to the sector uh, partners participating as well. I th wh whether it's mandatory or voluntary, I think the more collaboration that occurs uh, over time will strengthen that that information sharing um, and collaboration environment in such a way that you're, you're, you would be much better positioned to defend our critical infrastructure over time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I, may I add to that? Yes, please. Thank you. That's a really important question that you ask. And so I want to just focus on two things. I think first, it, this is why the scope, as you have put it in the bill, is so important to get right. If you're seeking to sort of boil the ocean and get information on a lot of things out there, you're going to wind up with a situation where CISA is deluged with information that's not helpful to them, it's not useful, and they also get bogged down with information that, that isn't really the actual threat and the highest risks that we want them and everyone else to focus on. So I think through the rulemaking process, that will allow the opportunity for engagement with sector specific, excuse me, sector risk management agencies, our sector coordinating councils to talk about those risks that we all believe from our vantage point are important. So beyond the scope, I think also then again, you know, setting up a process where there's a regular feedback loop. So CISA is also regularly getting feedback from owners and operators of critical infrastructure about what they are finding valuable. I think if we can, that's often been missing. So if we can kind of close that so that CISA then also has real time, you know, valuable information for them to help improve their operations, those would be, I think, a couple key pieces. And it's it's set up the way the bill is drafted to allow for that. But I think your role, of course, helping oversee that as it is implemented would also be a critical thing that we would highlight. Thank you. Would any other uh, witness like to comment? Yeah. Real quickly, if I may, um, you know, there's a concept that uh, Tony Sager, who, who led a big team at NSA, talks about, which is the fog of more. Um, when you're in a situation like this and where you're in triage mode, um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to put so much information out there to CISA um, that you're putting information that's extraneous, that's no noise, that's not focused. So you, you want some time, and that's why we think the 72 hours uh, to, from a confirmed uh, event is an important period of time to, to put in place and the flexibility to engage in conversations um, after that. I think what you're setting up, Chairman, is what I consider to be a virtuous cycle. Um, we're, we're, you talk about six years down the road. We know that the attacks are going to be probably very different than they are right now. We're going to have different types of networks, more software. We're going to be certainly in AI, in a world of AI, um, where systems are, are, are working with very complex uh, algorithms. What we need to do is we need to build information up so that we can look at the attacks. They actually become an opportunity for us to understand what our adversaries are doing, to see where we're failing, to see what's working, uh, and build that into going forward into the kinds of expectations we will have for refining the reporting, uh, refining the information that comes back, and most importantly, I think, for collaborating with CISA, collaborating with the intelligence community, collaborating with you know organizations that are looking at criminal activities. Um, what the beauty of this legislation, in my mind, is you're building the opportunities for a broader and more effective partnership in the context of a mandatory requirement. And I think, you know, credit to the to the committee for 
for real recognizing the value of maintaining the partnership the best parts of the partner partnership, but also on insisting on accountability and incenting companies to be, be to participate in this process. I think that's the big story. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back again. Thank you for uh, this uh, very thoughtful uh, legislation and I look forward uh, to its approval. I yield back. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair will now recognize the other members of the subcommittee for questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. In accordance with the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in their February 3rd colloquy, I will recognize members in order of seniority alternating between the majority and minority. Members are also reminded to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras when recognized for questioning. The chair recognizes for five minutes, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Clyde at this time. Mr. Clyde. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go forward then uh, and uh, have uh, the chair recognized for five minutes of uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Langevin, for his questions at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could start with you. Uh, in your testimony, you recommended that uh, only confirmed incidents should be covered by this bill, not potential or universal incidents. And I want to explore uh, that idea. Uh, the solar winds breach has brought new attention to the issue of incident reporting, uh, and for good reason. It took FireEye stepping forward uh, and confirming that they had been compromised for uh, the revelations of the, the, the larger solar winds campaign to come to light. So let's say that in the future, a nation state is conducting a similar espionage campaign against a U.S. critical infrastructure sector. So if critical infrastructure operators in this sector are not obligated to report suspicious network activity to CISA, and they are only obligated to report once they have discovered a breach uh, of confidentiality, integrity, or ability, how would we be meaningfully better positioned to proactively identify and mitigate this hypothetical espionage campaign than we are right now. So I think, uh, sir, that's a, that's a that's an important question. So when when I when we say confirmed, does that mean you're going to have every aspect confirmed? That you're going to have attribution confirmed? That you're going to know every system that's impacted? Um, no, that's going to take some time. In fact, if you look at Solar Winds, I believe it took months, eight months or so, to even detect it. I think, in my mind, if you have an, a significant cyber incident that has the kind of impact on confidentiality, integrity, um, and availability, uh, you're gonna you're gonna know it, you're gonna, you're gonna know it when you see it. It's gonna be a very obvious impact on on a pretty significant system, on a pretty significant function. Um, US government and system more likely than not is going to be aware of these uh, types of events. They're gonna affect federal systems, they're gonna be observable in some cases. So I think, you know. In the spirit of this legislation here, um, once a company realizes that it's been hit in a very significant way and has some visibility into that attack at some level and is maybe beyond the initial hours and days of triage, I would have every expectation, certainly in my sector, that there would be a conversation with CISA. Um, and of course, there are provisions here that if companies are not responsive, um, there, are, there are mechanisms in place to apply a stick that I think would be very painful and incent companies to come forward. If, if I may, sir, uh, can I add to that, uh, that testimony briefly? Sure. So, so actually speaking directly to, you know, the experience that we had uh, during solar winds that I think the way to think about your question is, is this way. So in the early days of our, our analysis of what was happening inside of our own organization, we had some information that looked suspicious, but you know, early, early on, we weren't quite sure if that was misbehavior potentially by an employee or just anomalous or something 
you know, um, unusual happening with our technology inside the organization. Once we had confirmation that there, there was, in fact, a, a significant compromise, we actually, that's when we came forward and, and made the, the voluntary notifications to government agencies. I think the point here is that not that you would you would never uh, disclose or you would wait until you had all the information available, but simply that um, you know in many cases in our experience you could have situations where initial indicators aren't indicative of an actual true compromise, and you want to allow organizations time to fully analyze what's happening in their environment and determine that there is in fact a real impact, and then have the qualifying event to to report to CISA. That speaks to the the uh, the relative value and and taking the noise out of the data that we talked about earlier. Yeah, and and you know I I think first of all you know we should ask uh, FireEye when they think uh, they would have uh, reported under this bill. Um, you know Mandy has testified uh, that he put um, uh, hundreds of people on it uh, for weeks before the disclosure. Uh, not 72 hours it was weeks uh and you know and those were were weeks where uh russia was was stealing data any any comment on that yes sir i mean again that's that's a great point and it's a, i think it's a reason why we are we are actually endorsing you know a a, a, a name timeline it's you know we're we're at the time and, and and to still to this day organizations when it's the breach is not affecting covered data privacy data hipaa data etc it's really under your own recognizance to determine the appropriate timeline and, and agencies and authorities to report to. I think by providing guidelines and, and actual uh, criteria, you're providing a, you know, a, a very clear uh, structure for organizations to report within. I think it's there's something to keep in mind here, and I think it's captured inside the bill already, which is 72 hours gets that initial window, and it gives some reasonable balance between analysis time and getting first indicators and warnings, you know, of of the the hurricane, let's call it coming, to to CISA. But I I you know I can say with assurance to you that that information is likely to change, adapt, and and evolve beyond the 72 hours. So I think in the bill, the way it's captured in terms of updating that information is also critically important. It can't just be that first um, reporting. There has to be information updates as more is learned throughout the investigation and analysis. And I think yeah. that speaks to your question regarding uh, Mr. Mandia's testimony. So if I'm just so I'm clarifying, so you don't think that FireEye testified, uh, you don't think that FireEye reported early enough? Uh, just to be clear that, that that's your, your testimony. No, not I wouldn't say it that way, sir. I think what we, we did the best we could under and under you know voluntary analysis and, and trying to understand what what was uh, the appropriate again timeliness and reporting authorities uh, under under a stressful situation um i do we believe strongly that um a reasonable period of time you know within that 72 hour window does make sense for most entities at least for an initial reporting requirement okay. well um Okay, I, I I know that my my time is uh, uh, you know um, is close to and let me just say that Madam Chair, you know as I'm highlighting here, uh, I'm a bit concerned uh, about the gap I see between the amount of information uh, uh, CISA needs to meaningfully improve the cybersecurity of our critical infrastructure sectors uh, and uh, the amount of information that CISA would receive were it only to be notified of confirmed cyber incidents. You know, to further illustrate this uh, concern uh, with the second example, let's say that there is a threat actor uh, who is deploying destructive ransomware across critical infrastructure providers, but has not yet activated it yet. Activated it yet. Uh, this is not unusual behavior. Once, confirm, once a confirmed cyber incident occurs, threat actors know uh, that news will spread quickly and they will have a limited opportunity to act before cyber defenders close off the vulnerability and root out their malware. This means threat actors are likely to start encrypting the files of all other targets they have compromised as fast as possible. By the time that CISA learns of this first ransomware attack, it, it could be too late for it to take any meaningful action to mitigate the threat to other entities 
in the sector, or importantly, in other sectors which are vulnerable uh, to the same malware. So, you know, uh, Madam Chair, as we continue to consider this bill, I hope that we're going to continue to explore what definition of cyber incident will best ensure that uh, CIS is able to uh, to do its job proactively when uh, it, it job and, and proactively warn critical, critical infrastructure providers of threats. I know my time's expired, so I'll, I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Langevin. Point well taken. Uh, wanted to just uh, let make sure that everyone is aware we will probably do uh, a second round of questioning after we hear the questions posed by the gentleman from Georgia, uh, Mr. Clyde, uh, for five minutes at this time. Thank you, Chairwoman Clark, uh, for holding this very important hearing with uh, Ranking Member Garbarino. As previously stated by my colleagues, cyber attacks are one of the biggest national security challenges that our nations face. And I am dedicated to working with all of you in finding solutions that mitigate these threats. I think one of the biggest challenges in addressing and understanding cyber attacks is encouraging entities to come out of the shadows and report these incidents to CISA. Um, there seems to be a fear that these stakeholders, um, that they could be unfairly blamed for these attacks. And as a society, I think we do not blame the store clerk when a business is robbed by a gunman. We blame the perpetrator and we work to bring them to justice. So I think our society must take the same approach when organizations report cyber instances and stop blaming victims for taking the correct actions to address these attacks. Um, so I've got some questions. I want to follow up on something that um, Mr. Uh, Bouchard said, um, and um, but I'll, I'll get to that. The, uh, the Federal Information Security Monitorization Act of 2014 requires the OMB to define a major incident and directs agencies to report major incidents to Congress within seven days of identification. The legislation we are discussing today would require the director to determine the time frames, but no earlier than 72 hours. And I think there's a, a disconnect between the way the federal government and the private sector report. So um, what I would like to know is whether this 72 hours or the seven days is the appropriate period. And if, or is it something else in between? I think Mr. Bouchard, you said that 72 hours was, was probably sufficient but Mr. Miller, if I could get your input on that, and I would also actually like to hear from each of the witnesses what their thoughts are on that time frame. What should the appropriate time frame be? Thank you. And if I could go in um, with Mr. Miller first, and then um, and then alphabetically, uh, Ms. Hogsett, um, Mr. Mayor, and um, Ms. Denbo. Thanks very much for the for, for the question, Representative Clyde. Um, yeah, well, as as we as as we say in our 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 written testimony and as as our policy principles indicated, um, and as I think we've heard from several other witnesses today already, it it, it does seem like seventy two hours um, does hit the kind of the, the the sweet spot, if you will, for for a variety of of, of different reasons. You know, I, I don't want to be duplicative of, of some of the other points that were made here, but, um, you, you know, just to, to put a fine point on, 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 on something, uh, you, you know, whether we're talking about the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015 and the information sharing under that act, or if we're, or if we're talking about uh, incident reporting requirements here, you know, the, 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 the goal of these, uh, hopefully, of, of, of these bills, um, uh, and, and, and laws is not to just share the information or just you know provide an avalanche of information or as much as possible. We really do need to 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 report information in a way that is going to be usable not only by 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 CISA but by critical infrastructure, by by other companies such as FireEye that that that, that are working uh, you know on the front lines of these incidents. So 72 hours seems to be the the amount of time that many cybersecurity professionals say is sufficient to determine what has occurred and to provide some of that additional contextual information that's needed uh, you know, to conduct investigations, to actually make sure that uh, you know, cybersecurity, uh, that, that, that you're actually also paying attention to, to trying to shore up your systems and avoid further damage 
Uh, and also, okay. it does seem to be uh, in line with a kind of a global standard, uh, if you will, in, in the 72 hours uh, time. Well, thank you. Um, Ms. Hogsett, are you concur with that? Sure. I think what we're all trying to do is we recognize the benefit and the value of providing more information into a central place in the government, in this case, CISA, to help everybody else sort of avoid attacks if it hasn't already hit them. So what you note around FISMA and the seven day, I would have to go back and look specifically at, at when that timeline kicks in, because we've often found in industry when the clock starts ticking can be very different. Um, we believe as structured in this legislation, it does allow, as John noted, a reasonable time period for a firm to do initial investigation without interfering with that important work that needs to happen, while still providing then useful information that could benefit others. I think the larger point that you highlight, though, is that we do have already in place varying different standards, and there is a need to ensure that there's harmonization. Industry certainly faces this. We have it with our existing regulations. Um, government agencies are likely also now, as you highlight, you know, to have to face that. And so this is something that we would encourage and would love to, to continue working with you and Congress on to help ensure that there's more of a, a standardized baseline and that everyone has a clear timeline and a clear set of expectations around reporting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Meyer? Yeah, so I'll be quick here just to add. I think um, I'm looking for the language. I can't find it right now, but two things. One is the legislation recognizes that there's a balance between the agency's desire to get situational awareness and to get information out that could be useful and the desire of a company to have feel that they have some sense of what, what happened. And again, going right. back to what constitutes confirmation, you're going to know it. If you've got a serious cascading impact on critical infrastructure, you may not know attribution, you may not know all the elements, all the systems that have been impacted, you'll know you're dealing with a significant incident. So I think you accomplish that balance. The other thing I would add, and again, I'm looking for it here, uh, in the Executive Order 14028 that the White House issued on improving the nation's cybersecurity with respect to what federal agencies are required to do and their contractors, they established, subject to check, I believe three days as the timeline for providing information. So I'm sure a lot of thought went into that discussion with other agencies. Um, and as it was pointed out, I think there are general standards around that time. So it, it's a reasonable not, uh, amount of time. I think if you if you tried to make it seven days, I think a good case could be made that things would be, you know, at that at that point, too far down the road in terms of potential damage. So okay, we wouldn't. I don't okay. think anybody in the industry is going to you're going to find anybody arguing for that that amount of time. Oh, all right. Thank you. Maybe we should tighten up the federal government's requirement then. Um, and um, and lastly, uh, Ms. Denbo, do you concur with that? I saw you shaking your head yes. Thank you very much, um, Congressman. There's not really a good answer to exactly what the right number should be. Should it be 72? Should it be 70? Should it be 68? Um, it's more of the key is that they are allowed to confirm first that they have an incident rather than just speculating that they have an incident. By giving it the 72 hours, now you're allowing the operator more time to gather valuable, useful information rather than just spitting information to CISA where CISA is gonna come back and ask more questions anyway. So it just allows that little comfort zone and space to be able to do the investigation that's needed to be able to provide preliminary information. Well, thank you very much. And, and Madam Chair, I see my time has expired, but I appreciate the witnesses uh, information here. You know, it's my intent that uh, we have um, a good industry input in the rulemaking process uh, to establish this bill, because I think that's very, very important. So thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clyde. Uh, the chair now recognizes for five minutes, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, Ms. Lee, are you muted? I think you may need to unmute. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you so very much. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for your leadership on this uh, very crucial issue. I just have two questions that I'd like to pose for those who would um, uh, answer it uh, and, uh, and, and give their insight. 
We know that a key consideration on the value of reporting is sharing information on the cyber attack, how a system was breached or compromised so that effective defenses can be developed. I'd like to raise the point of whether or not is it important for Pfizer, CISR to share this type of data with critical infrastructure owners and operators, knowing that uh, even to date, uh, there are um, at least 85% or more of the critical infrastructures in the private sector. The second question would be how this legislation would have impacted colonial pipeline. Uh, and the, the trajectory that they utilized, which was not open, uh, which was not, um, uh, they did not come forward uh, quickly, uh, and they did not provide information quickly. So I, I pose those two questions, and I give those to the particular witnesses who would choose to answer them. Or either I'll call on each of you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll, I'll take a so that the first question is absolutely important and critical in this week. We testified today that uh, it's a bi-directional information sharing is, is absolutely important for any, any information sharing regimen um, to be considered. So those indicators, those technical pieces of information around the specific vulnerabilities that were exploited and the way in which they were exploited are exactly the sorts of data points that CISA should be collecting and then um, you know, turning around to um, covered entities or to specific sectors as appropriate. As we know, in, in much of our uh, infrastructure today, it's fairly common um, technology. In many cases, those those sorts of uh, information and indicators will apply broadly, but there may be very, very specific vulnerabilities that only apply to certain pieces of technology that are only relevant in certain industries, and therefore, CISA will be, um, you know, they will have to tailor that uh, information sharing in a way that's again relevant to the defense uh, defensibility of those particular pieces of of technology in those sectors. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good. Can I have other witnesses answer the question, please? I'll gladly answer. This is Kimberly with the American Gas Association. Thank um, you. Yes, ma'am. So, repeating what Ron said, yes, the bidirectional is extremely important. Going on to the um, colonial pipeline matter, I will say that for nearly a dozen years, if not more so, the oil and natural gas sector, as well as the pipeline sector coordinating councils, have been asking government for a more streamlined reporting approach, um, regardless of whether it was mandated or voluntary. We said, is there a one stop shop where we can report a cyber incident? And there's constant, well, yes, well, no, not really. Um, so until that can be worked out, um, I believe the, the industry operators are reporting to whom they feel they need to report to one under certain given requirements, but then also, um, I know that at least with AGA member utilities, we tell them to connect with the FBI. So, so given the absence of that further information, that's kind of what we're working under, as well as to report to the TSOP, the Transportation Security Operations Center. So, let, so legisl thank you. Legislation that would give a framework for this would be helpful, and also the sharing of information would be helpful as well. That and bilateral part is so important. We feel like we feel like when we share with the government, um, it becomes a landfill of information with nothing valuable coming back out to us in a timely fashion. And that's not to criticize um, the individuals that are working with the process on the government side. Um, much like um, having a valuable byproduct out of landfills such as renewable natural gas, it would be valuable if a, we could have a valuable byproduct out of this data landfill being bi-directional information sharing in a timely fashion of actionable information. Thank you. Any other witnesses? Mr. Jackson Lee, could I also jump in on this briefly? I'd be, I'd be very pleased if you would, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Th th thank you very much. Um, I, you know, j just to add on to this, uh, the, the, the bi-directional point, it, it is absolutely critical and, um, uh, you know, again, as I, as I was suggesting earlier, uh, you know, it's, it's not only bi-directional information sharing. I mean, what's really key is what's the 
what's the goal and, and, and what is the and what is this bill for instance trying to do with this incident notification bill and I think I think that the, that the bill does a good job of articulating some of the different um, operational uh, you know goals that that the bill has for for CISA and you know greater situational and awareness is certainly part of it we can all agree that that'll be useful not only for the government but for the critical infrastructure community uh, but but then also at least based on, on on our conversations with you know the relatively new team at CISA, uh, you know I think they're really interested in in driving deeper operational collaboration between CISA, other government partners, critical infrastructure owners and operators. I mean th that that's really key, right? To you know we we, we always hear cybersecurity is a team sport. Um, Maybe it's a cliche because it's true, right? I mean, we, we, CISA can't, we, we shouldn't think of it as, you know, does CISA have the information it needs to protect the, the, the world from cyber threats? Because that's they're never going to have enough resources to do that. So they have to work with the private sector, and that's why private sector also needs this information. And this is a new world. Uh, we're going to expect <laughs> ransomware from now on, and I think we do need this cooperative, um, collegiant, and important uh, dialogue and discourse every moment if we can in order to fight against those who intend to really break our infrastructure. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the time, but um, uh, do I have any more time? Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, your, your time has expired. Uh, we are entering into a second round of questioning. If your time permits and you have further questions, uh, please keep your camera on and we will acknowledge you. Uh, having said that, I I'm going to it. Thank you so very much. I appreciate your Absolutely. Service. Absolutely. I'm going to acknowledge myself uh, for five more minutes. There are a few more questions that I have for our panelists, and I know that our ranking member will be joining me in questioning. Uh, Mr. Bashar, uh, how can CISA use data on cyber incidents to empower security researchers outside of CISA to improve security systemically across sectors? And can CISA do this in a way that protects confidentiality and an anonymity of covered entities? Yeah, thank you for that question, madam. Yes, absolutely. There's there's valuable use cases for information that CISA can share with either um, universities, public sector, other public sector entities, or private sector research firms uh, to do deeper dive analysis, more complex. Um, you know, analytics on information, uh, things that were mentioned earlier by, I believe, one of the other members related to more complex uh, um, sorts of ca calculations related to machine learning algorithms or other sorts of artificial intelligence based uh, capabilities that are today reside largely either in the private sector or in academia. I think there's a, a huge amount of value in that collaboration of information sharing to allow a broader research community to fully understand and analyze not only individual attacks, but again, the, the totality of what we're seeing in cyberspace and hone in on what are some key areas of either resiliency or defensibility, um, you know, to, to better protect uh, our sectors or our infrastructure overall. To your other question related to how that information can be shared or can it be shared anonymously or in a protected way for covered entities, absolutely. Uh, we do this um, all the time as part of our cooperation, not only with government entities, but with research partners, et cetera, where we are able to take co collective data in a way that um, removes any sort of uh, attribution to the source of that information or to the identity of the victim. It's how we produce a, a number of our own strategic reports, um, you know, for our customers and, and for the wider community. And we believe that there's there's concrete ways to, for that to be done in a way that protects the identity and confidentiality of the sources of that information, but benefits all parties from a research and development effort perspective. And from your from your perspective, having worked with CISA and critical infrastructure clients to respond to incidents. What role do you see incident response firms like Mandiant playing in this new reporting regime? And are you concerned that forcing security vendors to report on their customers will undermine trust and discourage owners and operators from working with the companies that have expertise and tools to make them more secure? Well, thank you for that question, madam. Yes, um, 
on the point of, of the role that private security firms play in, in protection and response uh, to cyber threats, it's certainly a capacity issue, as was stated earlier. We believe that there's, there's roles specifically for the government to, to assist directly with victims, as well as private sector partners like us and other firms. In order to do that in, in either model, frankly, there has to be a trusted relationship. These are often some of the worst days that organizations are facing. There's, so, there's very, very sensitive information that's being uh, analyzed within the, during the breach and within the organization. You are in a, in a situation of, of high trust with your clients, whether you're government support, whether you're FBI, whether you're Mandiant responding to a breach. The, the challenge with a mandated um, model where you are asking a, a trusted partner of a victim to then report uh, independently of that victim's authorization to the government of the fact of a breach puts us in a in a real challenging position. Any any individual any organization in a challenging position of betraying one trust in order to provide information to another partner, and we don't believe that that encourages a, a real. Um, cooperation or collaboration or effective way of sharing information. It also can potentially create challenges with contracts and language around legal requirements that we put in place whenever we're working with clients in a trusted manner. So I, I do think that uh, the, the model that's been put forth in this bill where it's the covered entity themselves, it's the organization that is the victim that is required to and responsible for, for ultimately reporting is the right model. I, th I think organizations like ourselves are, are in a good place to advise and support that compliance uh, for the victim, but that organizations and security vendors should not be compelled to do that independently of the client that they're working on behalf of. Very well. Uh, one of the goals in drafting this legislation was to provide system with enough information to analyze and understand threats, but to, but to do so without inundating CISA with false positives or inaccurate, helpful, unhelpful reports. I think that was raised in the, the conversation with Mr. Clyde. Toward that end, we have directed CISA to consider a number of factors when defining covered cyber incidents. And this is to the panel. What are the risks of improperly scoping the definition of covered cyber incidents? And how would that frustrate the goals of cyber incident reporting? Yes. So um, I, I might start here. So what you want to look for is the Goldilocks solution here. Uh, it can be too narrow um, or it could be too broad. Um, and you really have to find that right balance in terms of, uh, you know, laser on that kind of um, consideration. So uh, the fact that there is a process of engagement, that there's going to be a continuous dialogue, I believe, um, there'll be opportunities to say, uh, we didn't do enough, we did too much, it was too narrow, too broad, um, and to refine that. Um, but I think there are risks on both sides of that that equation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Ms. Hawk said, I think I saw your hand. Yes, ma'am, thank you. I, I, mean, I agree with Robert. I think the thing, the point that we would caution here is for a number of our financial institutions, they will potentially see thousands of pings against their systems. So if you leave the definition and the scope too broad, you would literally have from a single firm potentially hundreds, if not thousands of reports going in, which just is a massive amount. And it's it's not really the things that are going to, um, I think, cause the level of concern that you're looking to focus on. So again, we do believe that, you know, the opportunity for public comment and dialogue with sectors um, through the rulemaking process will help us, help us get to a good place. But we also do need to be respectful that this is going to be a new newer capability for CISA to build, and we don't want to send too much information to them because that would be too much noise in the system, and you would miss potentially really big things. And also for a firm who's then having to report, what that means is you're taking your frontline cyber defenders away from focusing on defending the firm and continuing to keep up with the, this dynamic threat environment that we have. And instead, they're focusing on making sure that they're submitting government reports um, so that they're not, you know, missing that perspective. So I, I think that's where that is a really critical component to get right. And, and we appreciate at least that the structure you've put in place would allow for that dialogue to get to the Goldilocks moment that Robert mentioned. Thank you. My time has expired and I thank my ranking member for uh, his indulgence and I now yield to him for any additional questions that he may have. 
Of course, uh, Chairman. That's actually an important question to get out. So I, I appreciate it and, and enjoyed the, uh, the witnesses, uh, their answers. Um, I want to do a little follow up. Ms. Uh, Hogg said maybe you could, uh, since most of your uh, members already deal with reporting requirements, both uh, uh, nationally and for a lot of states, how, what can we do? Is there anything we can do in this legislation to help, you know, harmonize, you know, what you what your members have to uh, have to do so it's they're not sending they're not uh, reporting on several different uh, hacks you know one for one agency and one for another you know based on different um, standards you know how, what can we do so it's easier for your members to to uh, comply with this this law uh, and I I will extend that to uh, some of the other the other witnesses as well after she uh, she answers because I'm sure you all have great ideas. <laughs> Well, thank you for the question. That is a, a really critical thing for us. Um, attached to my testimony, we did include sort of a compendium or a, a summary of the variety of requirements that we already have. Uh, this is why there is a provision in the bill currently that requires CISA to coordinate and harmonize requirements for those sectors that already have them in place. So for us, this would mean, you know, we would really strongly encourage CISA to work not only with our sector risk management agency, which is Treasury in our case, but also Federal Reserve Board, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. I mean, we have a multitude. Um, I, hopefully we've done a lot of that work to help funnel that to a good place where we can help align for them with what we already do. But that is really such a critical point for us that this gives us an opportunity, hopefully, to have a streamlined requirement with a common set so firms can provide information to one place. And then CISA should be in a position to help work across the government, including independent regulatory agencies, to share that information out. Um, based on the conversations we've been having with our regulators, we do think that everyone is really trying to align and do the right thing to help everybody, you know, protect their institutions, their organizations, and also the broader sector and our nation. So this is a, a unique opportunity to do that and your help and support by ensuring in the implementation that that coordination acquire, requ that required coordination occurs would be really helpful for us. Great. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to add on to that? Ms. Yeah, uh, sure, Mr. Miller. Uh, sure. sure. Uh, th thank you, Ranking Member uh, Garbarino. Yeah, I, you know, as I mentioned in my, I, I mentioned it briefly in my my oral testimony, and it's certainly in my written testimony as well. Uh, I mean, this is really a major issue, and frankly, even extends beyond the cyber incident reporting context, right? I mean, we've we've often talked about the need for regulatory streamlining because you know we not only we we have a lot of different sector specific regulators. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to to say anything more about that since Heather just just took care of that, but. You know, the reality is there are a number of different security incident notification requirements out there already, right, on, on companies, um, uh, you know, not only in the regulated sectors, but, you know, federal contractors, and we have the, the new executive order provision that was meant, meant mentioned earlier. Um, and, and one of the things that we recommend is really, you know, leveraging these, the various existing channels that are already set up uh, and having CISA do that to, to really make sure that that you know, that, frankly, the information is also being shared amongst the regulators, the the federal agency, right? And we're we're talking about bi-directional information sharing, but in this context, it's almost tri-directional. We we also need CISA talking to the FBI and the and the financial regulators, um, and and anyone else who 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 really has information or is receiving these reports. And one of our recommendations is that perhaps um, you know the. The, the Office of Management and Budget could, could issue guidance to federal regulators and law enforcement requiring this sort of sharing of information to make sure uh, that we're actually having a you know, an, an impact on the um, regulatory uh, overload, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate the bill for taking the first step in acknowledging the, mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah, Ms. Um, Emma, uh, I know you are, I think it, one of the next things we have to do is maybe do a little, uh, Federal preemption, all these different state regulations, state rules that you all have to deal with. We won't get into it now, but I know I'm sure I can guess how you all feel. But uh, right, uh, and, and, and it's beyond and, your uh, scope, perhaps. But there are also international uh, rules as well that you need to deal oh, with. Yeah. So uh, yeah. thing at a time. So I believe um, that the biggest challenge really is, and, and I speak from experience at the American Gas Association. We worked um, effortlessly to try to pull together um, a harmonization of all the different cyber assessments out there from all the different 
um, agencies, Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, TSA, um, and we were able to do something like that. But then when you take it back to those different offices, they believe that their system is the one system that works best. So I believe that's where the challenge is actually going to be on Congress to convince the different agencies that there is one system as opposed to all the different systems or how the all the different systems that are out there are not going to be overly burdensome to the operator. I, I appreciate those answers. Thank you so much. We'll definitely take that into consideration. And uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back, but uh, thank you again for having this uh, great hearing today. I thank you very much, rank, rank, Mr. Ranking Member. And I want to thank our witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members of the subcommittee for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for our witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. The, the chair reminds members that the subcommittee will record will remain open for 10 days, 10 business days, and without objection, the subcommittee now stands adjourned. Thank you for joining us today.